really enjoy questions. Thank you, Laura. Good question. Uh, I traveled to Norway, invited myself to uh, a couple of fish farm companies' annual general assemblies because uh, they want to pretend that we, we don't even exist. And there is a document now internationally, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. It's embraced at the UN. Norway was one of the early signatories or one of the supporters of this declaration. I went to Norway and put that in front of the AGA and to the media and to the Norwegians that I could because what I understood is this one fish farm company um, that the major shareholder is the Norwegian Oil and Gas Trust Fund. So the Norwegian people have a uh, major shareholder in this one, one company. And so what I said to the, at the AGA and I said to the media is trying to to, to get to Norwegians to understand that on one hand your country says you want to recognize the rights of indigenous people, on the other hand the money that you have that's held for all of you is put into play to absolutely disregard a First Nations aspirations. So I wanted to show the hypocrisy of what it was. And uh, it was an interesting trip to Norway. Uh, I don't remember the Winter Olympics four years ago in Vancouver? Did anybody read about that Indian chief that cast the spell on the Norwegian Olympic team? That was me. <laughs> I, was, I was driving on the Upper Levels Highway in Vancouver, and I get this phone call, and this I thought it was one of my friends pulling my leg, so I said, who the heck is this? And I took the S, and, and it was actually a Norwegian media outlet. And he was saying that there was the, the Sami people of Norway, which is indigenous people there, one of their um, spiritual men said that I had cast a spell on the Norwegian national Olympic team. And I thought it was quite fascinating that they would believe it for one. And so I had to, you know, I've been trying to convince my son I've got chiefly powers for a long time. But it's, 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 falling, it's falling by the wayside. But uh, to know that, that that story took on a life of its own. When I did an interview with Router, so it went worldwide. And I thought, how oh, well, something as so silly as this became so globally, um, you know, people wanted to know about it. And I, this this uh, media outlet put my Facebook profile up on their website, so now I've got like a hundred friends that are from Norway, and they always send me stuff. I don't understand Norwegians. I don't know what it is they want me to join. If I see a fish, well, I think about it. But to the, the real takeaway message that I had after engaging at the uh, AGAs with these fish farm companies. As they said, <coughs> we operate in the way your government allows us. And so that really crystallized my thinking about, okay, so now these companies, I can't play on their conscience, because when you start talking about corporate profits, there's no conscience. And I started to realize that our government is failing us in a very deep way to let international companies come in and do what they will. And the part that I would say to the Norwegian people, and I have many times, is uh, how can it not be exploitation of our people and our territories when they don't bring their best understanding of their operations and experience in Norway and they come to Canada and they pretend that they don't know that. And so they say, well, are you sure? Maybe we need to do some science. Again, delay, deny, and distracts and years go on. Norway's expensive. If you ever go, they bring lots of money. I bought two pizzas. I brought a cousin of mine out with his kids. Two large pizzas, like 225 bucks. That's the look I had to do, really. <laughs> First, you have to have a large family. Um, I came along in, in our First Nations history when we were, uh, we had undrinkable water, a do not consume water for 10 years. Think about that, a do not consume water for drinking water on a reserve in Canada in, the, in uh, uh, 2005. Uh, that's when I started. Um, so I became, I worked hard, uh, addressed the changes that needed in our village, 
As a result of that, I, I became the chair of our tribal council. And so what happens is as we get engaged, like my first, my first primary task was to rebuild our village. And so we have, we've brought in $18 million worth of improvements, which are 24 lot subdivision, six and a half million dollar water treatment project, broadband internet, two new wells, <clears throat> rebuilt the dock, eight new trailers, 12 new houses, just recently rebuilt our big house. When you take care of home, <clears throat> and you start to turn your attention to the territories. Because that was what I knew that was crucial to our people. But when you start to engage at a, at a more regional level, you start to have to speak in a different way. So you start looking at the principles that are the problem. And so when I became quite involved in, in getting drinking water for our community, I became very, uh, I learned a lot about uh, water regulation. And so I got to speak about this a number of times. I presented to three different Senate Standing Committees on water. And so what happens is other leaders sitting around at these meetings with, uh, like with the Union of East Indian Chiefs of the First Nation Summit, they notice who is, who is doing the heavy lifting. Now what I mean by that is understanding the broader concepts and the challenges and speaking to them repetitively or when the opportunity arises. So. That's how I wound up being involved in the UBCIC. It's uh, <clears throat> the, the principles and foundation of the Union of BC and Chiefs are very much in line with our views of the work. And we want our rights and title respected in its fullest form. And that's something that Canada continues to struggle with. <clears throat> um, how do you feel about the commercial fishing industry? Do you think it has uh, opportunity <coughs> for native prosperity? Or <coughs> Do you think it's a flag on their way of life? Uh, I was a skiff man for 12 years. I worked on a sailing boat out of Campbell River. Um, <clears throat> I wish Canada would remember what an economic engine commercial fishing was for the coast and all the, the trickle down. I mean, every dollar I made in Campbell River, I spent locally. Where is that industry today? We have, well, if you look at the uh, Cohen Commission, they examine the disappearance of 9 million sockeye. That to me does not show a department that's doing very well in terms of managing this wild resource which it holds responsibility for. And so now, <coughs> excuse me, they want everybody to forget about that, forget about the wild fishery, forget about the capacity that that meant in every community and all the isolated communities up and down the coast. And they want everyone to get into fish farming. But I want to see, and this is one of the things that drives me, is the passion to make sure wild salmon don't disappear. I would like to see the elders of our community, these incredibly successful commercial fishermen, have the opportunity to pass that up, that uh, way of life onto their children. <coughs> There's many of them. I mean, if you got, you're looking at it. I mean, the last figure I heard for a seine that was like over a quarter million dollars. That was a long time ago. So these people have a considerable financial investment into the industry. I'd like to see it continue <clears throat> because it's closer to the values that we hold as people. It's interesting how Canada wants to talk about, and BC want to talk about ecosystem-based management. And yet that's how we live forever. And so they want to deny us all the time, and then they want to come back and pretend our ideas were theirs. Is the fish farming more efficient though? Uh, I don't know. When you look at my my views on fish farm are pretty well known, but I don't see that it's sustainable when it takes in excess of one one pound of feed from fish to create one pound of fish. Uh, it, it's not sustainable. I don't think that the government is paying enough attention uh, to the in impacts that are going on, uh, both spatially and environmentally. Right. Um, Andrea had her hand up. My question is around the UN Declaration of Indian, er, Indigenous Rights, mm -hmm. and Canada was one of the four nations that didn't sign it at first, so I wonder what your thoughts are on that and how you were, you were mentioning the Constitution and how Canada doesn't recognize that, so I was wondering what your thoughts are. <coughs> when, when, uh, when Canada decided to not support the UN Declaration, certainly a banner moment in Canadian history, uh, when you look at the ones that were not party to agreement, America, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, well, common thread is there's very clearly indigenous peoples in 
and every one of them, of those countries. Uh, when Canada did accept it or did support the UN Declaration, they spoke about it being in relationship to Section 35.1 of the Constitution. So it's their way to say, we agree, but we're going to decide how narrow it's going to be. Because when we try to hold the government to account uh, for the Section 35.1 rights and, and what must be done to accommodate them, the government doesn't want to. And I've often said that with Stephen Harper, when he stands up and says he supports the UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People, he forgets to say, just kidding. Because they certainly don't mean it. And the problem uh, with many of the engagements I've had with the federal government for our First Nation, I've tried to put the very, even just the basic principles of the UN Declaration in front of them to act upon, but they won't do it. <clears throat> and I think Harper took a page out of Gordon Campbell's new relationship. Remember that new relationship was about recognizing Aboriginal rights and title and reconciling past infringements and so on. And yet when I sat with the government to talk about fish farms, the, and I'm talking about the deputy minister level, they would not, anytime we mentioned the new relationship, they always said, oh wait, you know more about that than we do. And I thought, well, you've got your, you know, the, the premier running around the province for four years waving this flag like it really means something, but it didn't. So what we have is that, um, it's like a measure of false generosity. Uh, if any of you have read Pedagogy of the Oppressed, it's a tough book to read, but there's some really good things in there. Because they want that, those false measures to make it appear like they're embracing the problem. And that way they can cover themselves when they go to court. Um, what do you, what do you think are the chances of the Nuchalas in their challenge, their court challenge to the FIPA agreement? <coughs> well, the, the Hapasasif, with their efforts there, it's really difficult to, to look into the legal crystal ball and see what's going to happen. Um, certainly, it, it showed me that there are First Nations that are paying very much uh, deep attention to the, these little movements by the federal government. And I'm hoping that there is some measure of relief there for them because it's a relief for all of us as Canadians. <coughs> uh, again, this is when, when, I, when I talked about that comment on how well democracy is working. Um, this is a good example of that, where we, uh, we see something that's really fundamentally wrong, but because we look at the world through the lens of the Constitution and our Supreme Court of Canada, we have a different starting point than most people. But, uh, I'm not exactly sure where that's at in the court. I remember seeing uh, a tweet about it about a month and a half ago, but I can't recall the details. I think the Nuchalas have, they lost their first, <coughs> uh, their first court round, and then they've taken, t taken it to the next level where they're challenging and appealing that original <coughs> decision for FIFA. This is uh, <coughs> One of the greatest challenges you face when a First Nation goes to court is you can anticipate it going to the Supreme Court of Canada. And so when you want to, if there's an activity planned for this part of your territory and you want to take it to court, you go to court and you win, the government will appeal it. And then if either parties are unsatisfied with that, you can appeal it and it goes up, you know, farther up to the Supreme Court of Canada. And so you're looking at a 10, 15 year window of legal wrangling and all the time, Either that industry continues at, at your expense for your territories. And so this is one of the greatest, what I see as uh, the greatest challenge uh, in terms of going to court for things. Our First Nation, we, uh, we were the first First Nation in Canada to have a uh, class action certified on the infringement of Aboriginal rights. Uh, if you're in the law, you'd be reading about the Chamberlain case, which I think is kind of funny. But we, we, did a, we did this class action, and it got certified, and it got overturned on appeal. And then once that was in place, then we tried to make applicators, sought leave to the Supreme Court of Canada, and it was denied. So just as an example to show that we had a, you know, something that was successful for us at one court level, and of course it was appealed, and then it goes to the Supreme Court. And the same experience now is when you look at the Tilkhotim people of uh, west of Williams Lake and their journey to the Supreme Court of Canada. It's like a 20-year journey, and millions and millions of dollars to get there. And I was fortunate enough, I, I drove across Canada with Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. Uh, we were playing catch-up to the 
so cold and fast that was bringing all their elders to the Supreme Court. <coughs> they left on the 30th of October, and Stuart, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and I left Vancouver at 1.30 in the afternoon on Halloween, as so we were, drove through the night and through the day to catch up to them. It was quite experienced. We left Vancouver at 1.30 in the afternoon, by 9.30 the next night we were pulling into Winnipeg. And uh, I let Stuart drive for about an hour and he got us pulled over by the police. I was almost asleep and I woke up and I could see the red and blue lights and I looked up and said, really? <laughs> but uh, with the Tilpotin or any First Nation that chooses to take it to that level, because there's a number of First Nations that have been um, very diligent in pursuing remedy through the courts. We have the, you know, the, the gift scam with suits and people in the Delta move decision, and you've called her, and you've got, uh, yeah. The other day I was at the Sheridan Overlap Territory uh, Conference in Musquid, and I took a picture with a friend of mine, Delbert uh, Garen, and so I put it on my Facebook, I said I was with THE Delbert Garen, because the Garen case is one of those ones that many of us refer to when we engage with government. These people that have vision to, to pursue things in the courts um, and to be aware that Canada outlawed us pursuing remedies in the courts for a very long time, about the same length of time that they denied us the opportunity to vote. And I always say, oh, Canada. 